think about that. Think about that. How great is the love of God? Greater than we can imagine. Greater than our ability to love. When we come to the end of our ability to love, it's like a drop compared to God's love, His immensity. God, we thank you. We stand in awe of your greatness, of who you are. And all we can do is say thank you. We bless you. We honor you. We present ourselves before you humbly. We love you. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, morning, Nick. Good morning, everybody. All right, all right. Thank you, Nick. We appreciate that. Dave, if you can turn me down just a little bit there. I'm a little bit hot on that. Well, for those of you who have never heard some of my story before, I grew up in a Christian family. Grew up in a good, nice, solid family who kind of did the right things, believed the right things. You know, I I remember um, when I was a kid, my dad being uh, baptized in a muddy old creek. And I'm thinking, you know, when we think of baptism, we think of washing and cleansing. And, And frankly, you know, I'm thinking of the, the day my dad got baptized as thinking he came out of the water worse off than he, than he uh, went in. But I wouldn't have exactly considered the family I grew, grew up in a people of prayer. My family really didn't pray. Now, I, years later, I would learn that my grandmother on my mom's side was a woman of prayer. Years later, I, I would begin to see that we would be over at my grandparents' house and for, for Sunday dinner. And my grandmother was an old-fashioned, unbelievable cook. I miss going to my grandmother's on Sunday tremendously because I was well taken care of by my grandmother. She was also my defender, my advocate. The one who would stand up for me when my parents were, you know, so kids, if you need that, find your advocate, all right? My grandmother, though, would sometimes disappear in the middle of making dinner, and I'm thinking, Nan, where'd you go? Don't burn the dinner. I'm here for the dinner, but she would disappear. She would get a phone call in the middle of making dinner, and she would disappear, And 10 minutes later, she would come back and her eyes would be all red and teary. And it took me years to realize that she had received a call, like on the prayer chain or something like that. And she would disappear and go spend some time on her knees pleading before the Father. My concept, though, of prayer growing up as a kid wasn't quite so developed. In fact, I can only remember two prayers that I ever prayed, and I probably prayed them a thousand times. Many of you probably know the prayers as well. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Now here's the next phrase that just killed me, though, because I never thought of anything else. Never thought of any other word of the prayer. If I should die before I wake, and that stay. I mean, what a prayer to teach a kid. So I grow up, and the only thing that I'm thinking about is, what if I die while I'm in my sleep? And I develop this fear, this phobia. I would not sleep with my arm hanging over the bed. Because if you slept with your arm hanging over the bed, who knows what might be lurking underneath your bed to get you. The Grim Reaper or whatever was going to get me in the middle of the night. Because all I was thinking about was, man. Why do we have to pray that I don't, oh, oh man. So, so I was a little fearful of that. The other prayer that I prayed a thousand times as a kid was this. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food by his hands. We all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. I said them regularly because I was told to, because I was made to. At bedtime, you said the one. At any time you ate, you said the other. But I never really thought about anything that I was saying. In fact, 
the foundational sentence of the second prayer we talked about, God is great, and then God is good. We're going to talk about God, His goodness, over the next couple of weeks. This morning we're going to talk about His greatness. Foundational concepts when we're talking about knowing God. And here I said this a thousand times, and i got to tell you, in the thousand times I said that prayer, never once, never once in my life did I think about God being great. You ever noticed how we can easily get into the habit of just saying things and doing things and never really think about what we're saying and what we're doing? And so this morning, I want us to think about the first sentence of that prayer. God is great. What do we mean by that? And this morning, I want to look at three attributes of God's greatness. What do we mean when we say that God is great? Now, when I grew up as a kid, my favorite cereal was Frosted Flakes. They're great. Now, when we're talking about God, we're talking about something just a little better than Frosted Flakes. Although, I got to say, Frosted Flakes, when I was a kid, were awesome. And when my parents weren't looking, you know what I did? I mean, Frosted Flakes are already just loaded with sugar. But I got the sugar container, and I added a little bit. So that when you got done with the bowl of Frosted Flakes, guess what was in the bottom? Just a whole bunch of sugar. And then you scoop it up with a spoon and eat it with milk. And oh man, it was so satisfying. But we are talking about something far greater than that this morning. I want to look at three attributes of the greatness of God. What do we mean when we say God is great? So turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And we're going to talk about three things this morning that make God great. God is majestic. God is one and only. And God is sovereign. And so let's read together in Psalm 8. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Now listen to this. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for or you account for him? Yet, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas and he ends the way he began. Oh Lord, oh Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Will you pray with me? God, I pray this morning that you would give us a sense, just a glimpse of your greatness. Bring us to a place of awe, of worship. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Three things this morning I want us to see. Some of them out of this psalm, and then we're going to hop around to some other places as, as well. First of all, this. God is majestic. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Now, what images or thoughts come to your mind when you hear the word majestic? What kind of pictures come to your mind? Quick. What? Like glowing. glowing. What? <laughs> Unicorns. Wow, okay. <laughs> wow. What's that? Unicorns. Unicorns. Oh, wow, okay. Unicorns are majestic. I mean, when I hear the word majestic, I hear, like, your majesty. 
right? I think of kings and queens in robes on thrones and images of bowing before someone who is important uh, or or to whom you feel uh, or deem superior to you. Now, in the ancient world and even in Europe just a few hundred years ago, you, know, you did not simply just come in to speak to or see the king or the queen. You had to be uh, invited. You had to be escorted in. And before you could speak, you even had to ask for permission to speak. Or else, you know, if not, if you didn't follow the proper protocol, you may not come out alive. I mean, you had to make sure that you honored them appropriately. And you had to bow before them showing your humility and your recognition of who they were and the fact that you were not like them. But we don't live in that world anymore, do we? In fact, what would you do if somebody said, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll do, I'll take a little risk here. What if I said, okay, guys, everybody here, look, I'm up here on stage and I'm standing up here. You should bow to me. Your response would be, <laughs> and that's probably tame, right? You would probably have a, no one. We in our egalitarian society that we live in, you know, we believe that everybody is equal. There's no hierarchy. There's, we don't want to put anybody above anybody in any way, shape, or form. So if anybody says, bow, our immediate reaction is what? I ain't bowing to nobody. And in fact, you might have a few choice words to use about that whole process as well. But that is not the culture that we live in or are familiar with that we read about here. However, here, here's the interesting thing. We tend to take what we know here in this world and what we experience here in this world and how we think, and we project those things onto God as well. And because we have this sense of, I don't bow to anyone, we easily come to that logical conclusion in our relationship with God as well. We refuse to honor in the right way. In the 1950s, a man named J.B. Phillips wrote a little book called Your God is Too Small. Because that's what we do. We kind of take God and we, we, we look at our relationships and our worldview and we p- picture God like we picture everyone else. And J.B. Phillips wrote this little book called Your God is Too Small because we have a tendency to minimize God. We have a tendency to reduce God to someone that we is, is like us, that we can explain, that we can define, therefore we can predict and we can control. And that's the kind of God that we like, but it is not the real picture of God. A couple of weeks ago, we were, we were on vacation. And I, one of the things that I always like to do at night, when all the lights are out, we're in an area where there's sea turtles, so they encourage everyone, turn out your lights. And so there's no background light. And I like to go outside and just look up at the sky. And you can see from horizon to horizon, without the washout of neighborhood lights. It was even more so a few years ago when we went to Montana. Now, who knows, what do they call Montana? Big sky country. Now, why do they call Montana big sky country? Because it's a big old sky out there. And we were out in the middle of nowhere. And there was, at, at night, I mean, the nearest town was 20 miles away. And when I say the nearest town, I mean it was a one light town. Didn't have street lights or anything like that. So there were no lights anywhere. So at night, it was pitch black. And you could see from horizon to horizon, pitch black. And in that backdrop, J. 
just millions upon millions of stars. You could lie there long enough and you would see shooting stars all over the place. Over and over and over. And it's incredibly humbling to look out at this immense, vast universe and then reflect on who am I in the midst of all of this. You know, scientists estimate that it is roughly 25, get this, 25,000 light years from us to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Now that's our galaxy. 25,000 light years. And that's just one galaxy among many. Look at where David goes with this. David has an experience like this. And he goes outside. He's in the Middle East. It's in the ancient world, so the city's not all lit up. He says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, and he begins by contemplating the vastness of the universe that he lives in. Think about that. 25,000 light years just to the center of our galaxy. And behind all of that is the designer, the engineer of it all. God. The Milky Way, just one among many galaxies. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, he said, then it leads me to ask this question, what is, what is man, who am I that you are mindful of me? Who, who am I that you would think about me? And the son of man, meaning people in general, that you care for, or the word for some of you who have done this study before, pakad, where are you, Jen? Is Jen in here? Pakad, that you account for him. Who am I in this vast universe? Who am I? And yet this is exactly what David says he does. You know, we've come to a place in our culture where we think everything can be explained. We think everything can be defined. We think everything can be understood, that, that we can wrap our minds around everything, and therefore we can predict and we can control everything. And anything that we can't control, we have to blame somebody for. Because we ultimately think that we can predict and control everything. And yet, note this. Every field of science comes to a place of limits, of mystery and unknowing. Every field of science, if you study, if you read, you know that in your field, at some point you come to a place that you say, you know, we really don't have an explanation for why this happens. We don't know how this really works. We can't see that far. And so we conjecture, we theorize, we come up with possible explanations, but we don't know. And that is in every sphere of life. We run up against this limitation. And folks, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Because a God that you can fully explain, a God that you can say, I know everything there is to know about that God, ain't much of a God. If we can wrap our minds around God and we can explain, we can predict and we can control and we can manipulate God, that's not much of a God. Because it makes him less than us but it's our tendency. The God of the universe is majestic in nature. Let him be so in your life. Take time. Backpacker Magazine used to have a, a theme. It was called Get Outside. 
Get outside. Look up. Get outside. Think about the ecosystems and the environment that we live in and how one little thing that happens here impacts this, which impacts this, which impacts this, which impacts things around the globe. And let your mind be blown because there is a God who is behind it all, who designed it all. You know, everything Pastor Dave talked about last week, that God goes through life with us, that God is big enough to handle whatever and that he goes through it, really only becomes mind-blowing when you realize what David says here. When you realize the immensity of who God is, that he is that great, that he is that powerful, that he is that majestic, and yet stoops down to our level to meet us where we are and goes through stuff with us. Psalm 8, verse 4. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you account for or you care for him. Yet, in spite of his greatness, in spite of his vastness, in spite of his unlimited power, he does care. What blows David's mind's mind is God's immensity, yet at the same time, his concern for us. Don't forget that. Number two, God is the one and only God. God is unlike anything else. In Isaiah 44 through 46, Isaiah the, the, is a prophet, and he talks a lot about the insanity of worshiping things that are not God. For there's only one true God who made everything else. Almost all of the prophet Isaiah's preaching is ironically, get this, almost all of his preaching is trying to get the people of Israel who were formed and called out by God, who have believed throughout their entire existence that it, there is only one God. And in fact, in their creed, in Deuteronomy, they say, what? There's only, there's, for God is one. There's one God. And it's part of the foundation of who they are. And yet Isaiah's preaching is almost exclusively trying to convince them that their worship of idols is worthless and there is only one God worthy of worship. God is unique. God is the one and only God. There are no words to fully describe who he completely is. Language works with the use of metaphor. We say, well, this is kind of like that. God is kind of like this. God is kind of like a father. God is, you know, we have Psalms that say, God is our rock. Now, do we mean that literally? Is God a rock? Of course not. We mean that God has certain attributes that are kind of like certain things that a rock does or maybe a rock is used for. A metaphor is literally a lie. Let that blow your mind for just a minute. Because we cannot fully describe who he is and yet he has revealed himself. God has called out to us. God has shown us. He has interacted with us to show us and reveal to us what he is like and who he is so that we could understand and begin to grasp a little bit of who he is. Remember when Moses led the people out of Egypt? And immediately they, they, they experience the unbelievable power of God and what he's done. And he rescues them from the Egyptians, the whole Red Sea experience. 
Immediately after that, Moses goes up on a mountain who led them out of the whole deal. Moses goes up on a mountain to receive revelation from God. You remember what happens down at the bottom of the mountain while Moses is gone? Moses is gone and the people begin saying, hey, this guy has disappeared. Who knows where he is? We need something. And they take gold and they fashion a golden calf and they bow down and they worship this golden calf. They needed something. We needed something to believe in. We needed something to hang our hopes on. Isn't it interesting how quickly and how easily we look for anything we can to hang our hopes on? But listen to Isaiah's words. In chapter 44, Isaiah 44, verse 19 and verse 6. It's one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. In Isaiah 44, 19, he says this, talking about you know, idols that have been made out of wood or out of metal and craftsmen have built them. Listen to the, one of the things that he says down in, in verse 19. No one considers... In other words, nobody really thinks about this. Think about what you're doing, people, he says. No one considers, nor is there knowledge or discernment to say, out of this chunk of wood that I am now bowing down before. No one thinks to say, half of it I burned in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and have eaten. And shall I make the rest of it? An abomination? Shall I fall down before a block of wood? Notice what he's saying here. He said, you cut down a tree, you chopped it up for firewood, you cooked your dinner over it, and then you took one piece that was left over, you carved it a little bit, you set it up, and you said, okay, it's a god. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And Isaiah goes on and on with the people about this. He says, are you kidding me? You take a hunk of metal, you form it into some kind of shape, and then you say, oh, this is my God. I'm going to worship this God, and this God is going to deliver us. This God is going to come through. We are so desperate for hope. And sometimes we're so desperate for an answer that we'll buy almost anything. If we think, it'll get us through. But listen to Isaiah's words. Don't waste your life on imitations and false promises that are not real and cannot produce. Don't waste your life on cheap imitations that are not the real God. There is only one God. Isaiah 44 verse 6 He says this when he starts out this passage. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not one. There is only one God. We are not simply free to choose to create anything we want and call it God and think that that is going to satisfy or save or produce what we want in life. Number three. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. In the story of Job, which we're not going to read, it's a rather long book, but it's an awesome story. For 35 chapters, chapters 3 through 37, 35 chapters, we listen to Job and his friends basically try to theologize and explain how God works, and who God is. 
Job consistently de defending his honor, that he didn't do anything wrong to bring on all the calamity that has, has come his way. And there's a lot of bad theology that gets bannered and perpetrated in this passage. And then God speaks. Finally, in chapter 38... You get the story set up in the first couple chapters, and then for 35 chapters, it's just a bunch of banter and speculation and people talking about how they really think God operates. It's like God listens to this for all this time. and find, You ever been in a situation where finally you say, I've, I've listened and I've heard enough. I've got to speak. You ever been there? I've, I've listened. I'm done listening. I'm, I'm talking now. For 35 chapters, everybody else talks. Then we get to chapter 38, and finally God speaks. Know what he says? After all this speculation, after all of these people trying to describe what they thought God was like and how God was supposed to work, he says, uh, Job... Were you there when I created all of this? Job, do, do, do you know what's at the bottom of the oceans? Job, can you measure the volume of the seas? Job, do, do, do you understand the mysteries of all of creation? Job, were you there? Job, can you explain? And he goes on and on and on with a series of rhetorical questions. Job, can you explain all of the mysterious ways that our world works? Job, are you in a position to counsel me and tell me what to do? God is sovereign. And what we mean by that is God is in charge. He is the ultimate authority. And get this in the psalm that we read. Yet in his sovereignty, in, in spite of the fact that God is the one who is ultimately the supreme one and in charge, he has chosen to give us the position of rule and reign, the responsibility to take care of of the creation that he has made. In Psalm 8, verses 5 through 8, he says, Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. And then he lists some of those things. You have put those under his feet. In other words, God has given us the freedom to rule and reign for him in his place. And yet God is the one who created it all and is ultimately the sovereign. Make no mistake, though. Make no mistake, God is the ultimate authority. Because in the passage also it says, what is man that, that, that you account of him? God takes an accounting. He notices and he sees. So, God is majestic. That makes him great. There's only one and only one God. And God is sovereign. God is ultimately in charge of all of things. Now, this is a lot of heady theology, a lot of stuff. What do we do with all of this theology, with all of this truth? How do we respond? I want you to notice, how do we connect with all of this? Notice in David's prayer that in spite of the vastness of God's creation, God still sees, takes note, and maintains accountability with us. God sees. In spite of the vast, you know, it, it's easy for us to think. I mean, if God is out there and God created all of this, there is no way, there's no way that he can be concerned about me. 
That's not what David says. Some of you here this morning may feel invisible. You may feel so unknown. God, are you really there? God, do you see? God, do you know? God, do you care? Because maybe in the sphere that you live in, that's the way you feel. And that's where you are. Maybe you feel invisible to those around you. Know this. If you don't take anything else from what we've read or done this morning, know this. God sees you. God notices. He may be so vast that he is able to create this entire universe, but he is still intimately connected enough to know and see you wherever you are. He sees and he knows. I want you to notice also this, that we have purpose. Some of you may be feeling like, you know, I, I just have no clue where I fit and how I belong in this vast universe. Know this. That's what he's talking about, what David is talking about here. That God has given us purpose. That we have a place of dominion and authority and a voice and a sphere. And God is telling his story of his greatness and his goodness through us. You have a purpose. Wherever you are, wherever you work, whatever you do during the day, know this. You have a purpose. You fit in what God wants to do in his creation. Three things to wrap up this morning that maybe we need to do to respond to what God has said to us this morning. Number one, recognize our limitations and responsibilities. Recognize our limitations and responsibilities. Let I don't know drive you to the one who does. You know, it's okay to say, I don't know. When we come to the end of our ability to explain, predict, control, define, let that drive us to the one who does know. Let I don't know drive you to the one who does know. You know, astronomers tell us that there's roughly 100, get this, 100 billion to 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Now think about that. But now listen to what I just said. 100 billion to 400. There, there, there's a vast difference there. You know what that means? Translation. They don't know. We have ways of seeing and then we speculate, well, if this looks like this, then maybe there's... So they don't know. Maybe there's 100 billion, maybe there's 400. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe there's 400 billion. But that's a vast difference. We don't know. But God does. The fact is, in every area of study, we come to a place where our ability to understand comes to an end and we have to speculate, guess, and theorize. In an old song that I love called God's Own Fool, I want to read the, this line to you. So surrender the hunger to say you must know. Surrender the hunger to say you must know. Have the courage to say I believe. For the power of paradox opens your eyes. And blinds those who say they can see. Translation. Let I don't know lead you to the one who does. Be willing to admit I don't know and I can't know. I'm not God. Number two. Maybe you need to respond this morning by removing your idols. 
Maybe there's things that you are worshiping, that you are bowing down, that you are looking to to save you, to give you meaning, to fulfill you, to satisfy you. And Isaiah says, don't waste your time because they're not going to come through. Are there things that are replacing looking to God that you're looking to find satisfaction and fulfillment in? If so, don't waste. Don't waste your life. This is the only life you get. This is the only life I get. Don't waste it. Number three, release our praise. Release our praise. God is immense. God is majestic. Acknowledge that. Say it. The word that we translate worship over and over in the Old Testament, it's a Hebrew word. It's hishtahave. And it literally means this. To bow down. To bow down. We translate it worship and we think it means a whole lot of other things. But literally what it means is to bow down. Maybe this morning what we need to do is just bow down before God. Lift our praises to Him. Acknowledge that He is God. He alone is God. At the end of the story of Job, that's where He comes. In Job 42, after God confronts him, he says, all right, I get it. You're God, I'm not. And all is cool. Let's pray. God, thank you.